Welcome to the Chip Black Live podcast, where I sit down with proven, tested top business leaders in the real estate industry throughout North America, where you get to take a look behind the curtain of their business and lead with some immediate action steps. And we've got a dual threat here today. I'm really excited about um, everyone wants to know how someone has a team of 15 agents that closes 600 transactions. But there's a second person. Everyone knows about it. And with his humility, he didn't expect this. Everyone knows about it. But on the backside of this, we're going to not, we're not going to talk about fellow. This isn't a product um, conversation, although it's a phenomenal product. But we're, we're going to talk about the uh, the work he's done in launching this product, which right now, by the way, is the number one growing, I think, um, lead generation um, product on the marketplace. And and that's not hype. I mean, it's just it's just the real deal. Ryan Young, CEO of the Young Team. Ryan Young, CEO of Fellow. Welcome, brother. Thanks for being here, man. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited, and you know I've got to listen to uh, other people that you've done this with, and so to be in this lineup to me is obviously it's an honor. Cool. So you know it was funny. I mean, I saw in the um, on some weekends on social media. I'm like, well, oh, this guy is into the food, man, and he's he, well, he's just an entertainer. And he's a family guy. And then I was talking to your brother, and he says, well, you know, when Ryan was at culinary school before he went to hospitality and he gives you, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. So from culinary school to the hospitality of the nightclub industry for years, um, tell us real quickly, how the heck you ended up in real estate, man? Yeah, it's funny. Just, I, I actually, I'm, I'm a passionate guy and I was a big football player in high school and turned down opportunities to play college ball, to go to culinary school. People thought I was crazy, right? They're like, what are you doing? Um, but I just, I love the, the culinary industry. I loved hospitality. Uh, I did it for a decade. I, you know, worked full-time in restaurants all throughout high school. Then went to culinary school, went to hospitality management school, worked in the restaurant and nightclub industry in Vegas for six years. And then I hit my mid twenties and had a mid 20 life crisis where, <laughs> you know, I was just living a fast life. And while it was a lot of fun, I finally got to a point where I just, you know, I was ready to get back to my Midwest roots and go back to Ohio. My folks were realtors in Cleveland. They had a small team, just the two of them. Um, and, you know, my mom sold real estate for a couple of decades. And my dad finally joined her in his, I'd say, late 50s, early 60s, thought they could do it together. And I called him up and said, you guys are going to think I'm crazy. But what do you think about your boy moving back to Cleveland? getting his real estate license, joining you guys. Uh, the funniest thing was it was in 2009. And at that time they were like, that's a terrible idea. And I was like, yeah. Let's do it, you know, and you're like, perfect. Yeah. I haven't looked back. I was so naive and innocent. I had no idea what the market was, the direction it was going. And ironically, it was one of the best things for me was entering in, started getting licensed in that market. Um, but I, it was rough. You know, the first three years were, I was doing everything I could to just help them take pictures, MLS input, spike signs in yards, do it, you know, all the things that like, while I was also working full-time at a restaurant, I was living in their basement. And my late twenties was me really questioning my life of like, I was living in Vegas, living my best life to living in my parents' basement. The market was not in a good place. And, you know, it, it's, it ultimately is what the foundation was. Is this what I really wanted to do? And when I truly committed to it, I would say it was like 2012 is when all of a sudden we started to just, let's do it. So what point, let's, let's fast forward a bit. Um, what point did in your real estate career, how long were you actually from the point that, okay, you know, I did a lot of the intern, the sac that's what I want you guys to hear. Y'all, you, you, you see the, the intro, 600 units, 15 agents, but it's like, you know, there's no shortcut. So I just always want to remind you all of that. It's what did you do? We're going to talk about what he's done. But, you know, the number one question you'd ask people like Ryan is what did you overcome? Right. What did you overcome? So with that said, how long were you from the point that, OK, now I'm in sales to the point of discovering, you know, something I'm going to start um, growing a team. Where was your personal transaction count at when you made that? Yeah. I was selling 
personally, I would say somewhere between 75 and 85 homes a year myself. Right. And it was, this is right when I first, and it was a lot of buyers, like, you know, so that was crazier than your life you were living in Vegas. So that oh, yeah. I mean, it was just not, you know, I was hitting multiple open houses a weekend, you know, not to be the whole like this. It was so much harder back then or, you know, you guys don't understand how hard we had it or whatever. It was just more I was just grinding and I loved it. I loved putting deals together. Then I started getting a taste of hitting expireds and fizzbos and started realizing this could unlock this whole other opportunity and channel that I didn't really have access to, which was listing properties. So when I, I would say I was, um, it was probably like 2014, 2013, 2014, where I got to the point where I'm like, all right, I'm making some money compared to living in my parents' basement. I moved out of my folks' house. I was, you know, I got a place and all of a sudden it was like, I started surrounding myself with some of these other larger groups of people that I'm like, I want to be like that guy. And I want to be, and it was like, and I started seeing, you know, some of these players who ironically are most of your clients, right? And I kind of idolized them for this long period of time. And it was like, well, if you want to be like that guy, get in the same room as that guy and start to seek wisdom and all these core values that we really preach about being coachable and adaptable and learning and staying humble. And it was like, once you start getting into those rooms and you start seeing how much more is up there, right? And the funny thing about it is every time I get into a new room, I feel like I'm the smallest person in the room, which gives me that hunger and appetite to grow to, you know, what some of these other people show you it's possible. And I'd say like that 2013, 14 was when I started seeing what people were really doing from a building a business, building a team, building an organization. Um, and that's when all of a sudden I got it just totally addicted to it of like, Let's go. So brought on an uh, admin. Then from there, started bringing on agents. I was super selfish. I was taking all the best opportunities. I was continuing to sell 100 plus opportunities a year. And I was basically giving them the scraps. And I thought I was being a great leader. And then I'd say like that 2017, 2018 was when I finally started saying like, wait, if, if I'm really going to grow an organization, I got to get out of production. And so that was that next transition of like, you know, how am I supposed to in good faith recruit team members and say, welcome to my team. I'm going to give you some of the opportunities, but not the best opportunities I'm going to take. I'm going to take those myself. And when I started actually detaching from even my own clients, even though I lost a couple because they only wanted to work with me, that's where it really started to open my mind up to what a real business looks like. Really good. When did you, uh, because you're amongst those wizards and genies, that you looked up to. I want everyone to hear something else that he, he said, but didn't say he wouldn't be here probably if he didn't compare himself to others in a responsible way. We're taught not to compare ourselves to others. They say get in the rooms, but then when you get in the rooms, compare yourself to others from a space of inspiration. I just want you guys to hear that really, really quickly. Keep yeah. a humble mind and, and seeing that. And, and, and you always stay in that spot. When did you get into, cause now you're, you know, an online lead gen wizard um and and even underneath inside the database of what people already have but when did you really step into the marketing space and the online space because yeah. you did the uh, the basic stuff we all did in the beginning but when did that start happening and talk to people about about that progression for your business yeah and, and just real quick when you say you know like when it's kind of like you're not supposed to compare yourself to others Think of being a little kid and shooting that three pointer and you think you're Michael Jordan counting down the clock, three, two, one, right? Like we can idolize and we can, you know, um, conceptualize what it's like to be in that person's shoes. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to be that person, right? And so when I looked at what some of these people were doing, I didn't want to be that person. I just saw the opportunity of what those people were doing, how they were defying what is possible or what I thought was possible from growth. And it's, you know, it's inspirational and fuel for me. And that's the type of things that fuel my growth, right? But um, where I started really moving into the marketing space heavily was in 2015 or 16, I joined, once again, I was at this point where I saw what some of the bigger agents were doing and I joined Ra radio and television experts. Yeah, and good for you. you that was a, yeah, yeah, that was a big move of like, I have like, a couple bucks set aside, let's go in on radio and let's just, let's just do it. Right. And so, um, I started getting on radio and we started, I started seeing like a major lift in lead flow. And I started seeing geographically all of a sudden opportunities coming from all over Northeast Ohio, which 
most agents, they service the market that they live in or this tight, you know, geographical space. This really opened my eyes up to what our footprint really could be. You know, I was getting calls from people 45 minutes away. Radio TV doesn't have boundaries, essentially, in your metro region, right? And so uh, we started doing this, if I can't sell your home, I'll buy it guaranteed, which I had no business saying that message, uh, but it made the phones ring, right? And I was kind of one of those guys like ask for uh, forgiveness, right? Uh, <laughs> and it was one of those things, like if someone wanted me to buy their home, I would have figured out a way to buy it. But I started seeing massive lead flow come in. And then in 2019, I got a call from a gentleman who basically just said, buy my house. And it's like, that's not how the program works. It only works if I can't sell it. And he said, make me an offer. And I made him an offer finally after he asked me like eight times and he accepted it. And I kept telling him, you should not take this offer. I'm happy to buy it for this, but don't take this. This is not in your best interest. He still took it. And it, that started opening my mind up to not everyone is focused on the same thing. Not everyone wants a one size fits all. I'm trying to sell my house for the most amount of money. Some people have other priorities, objectives. And so I started really leaning in in 2019, 2020, 2021 into the whole I buying. We started really leaning into that message, retargeting people, uh, building this massive inbound funnel of sellers. And it really opened my eyes up to how beneficial that was for the young team, even though we were buying about 15 to 20 homes a month, which was really profitable. It was a great business model. We built some technology that made it just so much more efficient. And what I started to see was really, there is such a major opportunity on the seller lead generation side of our business that really no one's cracked. And we all know how to turn on the buyer lead flow through PPC and these big third party companies. Um, but really, when you ask people, you know, what's your seller lead generation strategy? Most of them don't have one. And so we kind of took what we were doing to create this massive inbound funnel of opportunities, which originally started as more of like a cash offer type of platform. We realized that very few agents in the, around the country do the cash offer. So we pivoted to just focusing on seller lead generation as a wider funnel. And, you know, from there, I just became obsessed with it. And, and what's cool is, is you get to work with, you know, we, we have, we're adding about a hundred new teams a month on the platform and they're the best of the best on fellow. I get to work with their marketing teams. I get to observe what they're doing, their best practices. And so it's actually shaping some of the things that I do with the young team and shaping the way we build the product. And it's now, it's just become an obsession. Isn't that cool? I mean, Ryan, like, and we know this and we're going to get it too. It's like, man, I love talking to you. I love talking to Justin. I love talking to Deborah Beagle. Wait a minute. I'm the chief. No, I'm the student over here, right? right. I'm the student. I, I, I sit on calls with teams, CMOs, director of marketing. Uh, and it's like, damn, that is really friggin' smart. That How is that working? How can we automate that? How can we make that more efficient? How can that plug in with what you're doing over here so it talks to this? What is the overall holistic approach to your seller lead generation and how can we help you fuel that? And it's just been such a blessing. And it's so cool because one of the things that I, I really am proud of is while Fellow is rapidly growing and it's this really cool hot product and platform and I'm still really passionate. I'm probably, I'm, I'm still very emotionally attached to the young team and the young team's my baby. And like the success of the young team is what's really important to me. I feel like I would be essentially a fraud if, you know, fellow, I have this big company that's all teaching agents how to market and seller lead generation in the young team is a failure. And so to me, I, I'm probably even borderline paranoid with the success of the young team and want to continue to see the young team succeed because I feel like it gives me the credibility when it comes to talking about fellow to say, I know what it's like to be in this with what the market's doing or with what where the pain points are in the market. And here's how we're actually doing these in real time with the young team. I believe so much in this, that this is what we are actually using and this is how we're doing it. And to me, I think that's really, I want to make sure that both of them lean on each other. I don't ever want it to be like, wow, fellows just taking off, see a young team. The young team is, it's really, would, it would be impossible without the young team. Yeah, really good. Well, and I'm watching you do it because I'm watching you step through doorways of, of, of discomfort. You've had, I mean, long, long-term relationships. And I mean, people that are really bought in, uh, my sense of your people is, 
is they're not just agents or leadership. They take ownership. Um, how did you, let's go back to, to the piece of, how did you, was it, was it all the listing business that was coming in because you weren't an active outbound recruiter, but you needed to have 15 people to close 600 transactions. What would you say was the, the number one magnet for your attraction of human resource that if I'm not mistaken, many of those folks have been with you for years. Yeah. Um, one of the things when, before we started coaching, uh, I, I used to really resist and push back on your message of Navy SEAL, right? And I heard you for a long time, like, because we ran a Navy SEAL model. And the funny thing is, you know, like, what's that guy saying? He's crazy. <laughs> well, and it's the funny thing about it is then, you know, when you run a Navy SEAL model, quote unquote, um, when one of those Navy SEALs leave or two of those Navy SEALs leave, you are really exposed. And that was a major eye opener to me where your message started to become real to me was I needed to have some sort of, I'd say strategy around, we want to continue to run a very high per productive agent type of model. Maybe it's not 40 to 45 homes a year, but maybe it's 25 to 30, right? We have a minimum of 24 to play in our team, right? And, and, your, and your leaders who jump on time to time with us, they protect that and are going to support it Not from a resistant. We don't want, they want to grow, but what's really neat. I want you guys to hear this too is, is he's got people that want to protect it and support it, not resist it. So right. add that in Ryan. So they, they it, catch that. Correct. And, and that was really, um, we just discovered this, I'd say over the past three to six months was what we call our sniff test of, you know, who can play on our team and who can't. And, right. and what, I think was happening was we were really trying to push newer agents onto our team and there wasn't the buy-in from the rest of the team. And I think we are just at a place right now as an organization where we want to continue to attract production, right? They don't have to be a $20 million producer or a 30 home a year producer, but if they've sold 10 homes in their career or 15 homes or you know they sell 5 million a year, we want to help them become a $20 million producer. And that's not our long-term vision, but for right now with where we are, with the resources we have, with the bandwidth that we have, I want my team members to go all in on the people that we're bringing on. And, you know, one of the things you always talk about is, you know, the spirit of volunteerism. It's like you lose that spirit of volunteerism when they don't believe in the mission, you know? And so for us, we've all become very aligned in a united front on what our mission is with the talent and the people that we really want to help build their business for where we are right now, right? Long-term, as we continue to evolve operationally, and then I think we can expand our offering. But for right now, we are very committed to essentially that agent that we want to get north of $10 million in production, someone that really wants to sit on our sales huddles and we talk about go to the board, that isn't embarrassed to go to the board in front of everyone else because they're so far apart from what their production is to the rest of the team. And it's just something that I think we finally accepted. I, I think I felt like we have to recruit more agents. We need to be net six agents a quarter, all these things that like you hear some of these bigger teams saying, but what I've realized is we have to retain the great agents that we have while also bringing on great agents. And that's our model is for where we are in business right now is we're very focused on empowering the ones that we have while also looking for other talented ones that fit culturally well with what we're doing. Really good. I want you to hear what he said and, and really eliminate this because a lot of times people aren't there is um, he talks about the sniff test. What he was doing was finding out who is his exact avatar yep. and he identified it, but also got alignment from his agents. And I'm not talking about, you know, the, the star player that runs up to the GM and, and, and tells them how to do their job. I'm talking from a collaborative effort. So I want you guys to really the patients aren't running the asylum. The patients are walking alongside, you know, the people operating the asylum. And I wouldn't call these people patients. They're, they're amazing human beings. So what, um, when, when you, when you look at this, what would you identify? Two things I want to look at. If you're to look back historically at these wonderful people, I have, I have an opportunity to speak with four or five of them, um, frequently with you, um, I want, to, I want to find out two things and let me share two things with them. If you were to look back historically, what would you say the one common thread is? Because the toughest thing is to predict who's going to be productive. 
Mm -hmm. You sit here and think, you know, John, if I look back at these group of people that, you know, I've had the opportunity to spend time with and and, and then the rest of your group, what's the one common thread um, you would say to look for, you looked for, would say that they have um, to, to bring forward that sort of production? Yeah, I would say uh, there's a couple, like if you had to look at like the DNA, what I would say is most consistent is they all have a little bit of an edge of competitiveness in them, right? Um, That's probably the most consistent, Um, but they also all have this uh, 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 togetherness and also they like, it's, it's a very weird dynamic because you don't think like competitiveness, you think of like, you know, people competing against each other. Um, there's that, but there's also this, like when we did our feedback loop, for example, I was really uh, surprised to hear the amount of people that said, we want to be together more, right? We want more in person, which you're like, John, they want more meetings, but they want more meetings. They want more in-person stuff. And it was like, after COVID, I was like, we're never going to be able to get them back. Right. But they want to celebrate together while they also want to, you know, celebrate their wins in uh, in front of everyone. But it's just this very unique. It's the kind of the dichotomy of like, how do you find people that are great team players, but are also super competitive and want to win and and want to contribute to the win? Um, And if you look at, you know, if you look at sports and, and sometimes you have these these players that are really just focused individually they could care they're they're upset even though their team's winning but they didn't get the ball right and it's like that doesn't work in our our model that doesn't work in our team we're just too tight um we want the players that are celebrating the win and this this game this guy had three touchdowns and in this game she had whatever a massive month and we're celebrating it but they know if you're having a big month we're coming for you next month right and if you have another big month we're celebrating it but now we're really fired up And, and it's just a very unique you know, environment to have the both of those of support, but also competitiveness. And that's, I, it's, it's when you look at how small we are as an organization, that's really the way I think that it stays so tight and continues to move forward is because we celebrate the wins, but we also really want to win ourselves. And what's really neat for me in chat with you is that I'm, I'm sitting here uh, hearing you explain them and going to the moments when I get to sit with you guys, and I'm sitting like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, you can feel the competitiveness with them, but you can also feel the care with yeah. them. You you found that sweet spot. My my mentor used to call it coopetition model. Coopetition. We, we we compete, we cooperate. We're a coopetition model. And that's how it works. Yeah, uh, and, and so you have this. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, and, and really that keeps the egos out really quickly. Um, and we've had some egos and you can just tell. And one of the things you used to always talk about is like the people or the principles, right? And one of the things that you can see gets very exposed quickly. And when me as a leader, where I struggle is when I move to the people and get away from the principles. And when those people come with some ego and come with some drama, they very quickly put themselves on an island in our organization. And they normally self-select out. Um, just It's interesting how th- that has become the culture of the principle. Really good. So you've got the foundation of the attributes of a human being. And I'm asking this for everyone else. I want you guys to hear this because there's more to it. Step two, you're a highly competent salesperson, trainer, marketer, but you can't make people productive. But you have facilitated this condition that is not normal. If you were to going back to sure, you got to have the right people. But we've all seen where the right people have been somewhere and or we didn't know at the time, but then they go somewhere else and they do really, really well. So you had to have this other part. If if you're taking a look at, and I know this is tough for you because you're a really humble dude, what would you say has been the key to you taking these human beings with these attributes and then supporting them to be productive at a really, really high level? Because you can't just go, hey, go sell a bunch of houses. You know, I'm putting you in a spot here. Brag a little bit on you. How have, how have you made that happen? Because you're the leader. You get to own what doesn't work and you get to own what's working, brother. But to be honest with you, there. Um, I was actually going to say just the opposite. I think it's really 
when I've tried to motivate, I think that message is uninspiring. I think they're motivating each other. And I've seen it more come from within or come from below up. And it's, it's, you know, I'm a comp- everything that I'm saying about them, competitiveness and the caring and all that, that's an extension of me, right? I am the most competitive dude out there. Like no one needed to build a software company after we were building a big real estate team, but it's like, I wanted to level up to, you know, what's next, what's the next, you know, um, to me, what's really, it's almost frustrating, uh, is, and it's also humbling is there are times where I want to motivate, right? And I can tell it's not moving them at all. But what I see is moving them is the 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 encouragement. We have this group text with all the salespeople and it's like, it drives everyone crazy, but we all love it as much as we're like, oh, it's so annoying. It's just all day long. But I see when there's this lift of, you know, someone's discouraged and, and everyone comes from below and lifts them up, right? Where I see the celebrations and- you know, it, it's tough being someone that wants to win, being super competitive to know that a lot of times it's not me moving them. It's our leaders. It's our, we really have a team full of leaders. And I, I even just saying that in real time, the more I think about it, it's, it's almost like, am I not doing my job as a leader? Right. Because I can't find ways to inspire them. But I think that's actually what I've accepted is that's how we build. That's how we grow. That's, and that's okay. It doesn't need to be them, you know, sprinting. Cause I'm telling them to sprint. It's more them actually listening to each other. And, you know, it's, it's powerful. I actually, I really haven't thought about it, but the more I just think about it right now, it's like, you know, it's, it's a, it's a struggle to not have as much influence as maybe I used to, but it's also really, um, I'm really proud that I don't have as much influence and we continue to grow and continue to, to build together. This is really good. So let's go a little bit deeper here, Ryan. So what's interesting, though, is that your job is to allow people to come forward. But here's the difference. And I want people to hear this, though. What you did not do in bringing people forward, that's your responsibility to bring talent forward and let them shine. And many leaders don't because they're afraid if they give someone too much power, exposure, they're going to go away. And so really, you're limiting your business. But here's the question I'm going to ask you, rhetorical. Okay, great. You've got them coming forward. But then didn't that hold you accountable to constantly then keep modeling the way you live and how you operate? For sure. For sure. Modeling versus, right? For sure. That becomes the model. Um, And and there are times where I slip back in and I have to catch myself. And luckily, my leadership team is not afraid to call me out really quickly. (laughs) There are times where I all of a sudden get a little snippy with like, what are we doing, guys? Like, we need to work harder. We, and that's just uninspiring, right? And there's times where, you know, my this, certain people on my leadership team are like, you realize that over 60% of our agents are having their biggest year yet. But we feel like it's a, you speaking to me, are disappointed because our numbers have gone backwards as an organization. We lost some people, some of our agents aren't producing as far, but it's like that message doesn't, isn't relevant to the the 60% of our team members that are having their best year ever. And we're sitting there and I'm sitting there saying, guys, we have to move faster. We have to work harder. And they're looking at it like I'm having the best year of my life. Like, and so it's been really uh, humbling and it's, and it's really opened my eyes up to, from a leadership perspective of just, Things that probably motivate me aren't the same thing that motivate everyone else. I'm much more coming from a kitchen. It's much more like autocratic, much more do this. You're never right. It's always like it's either perfect or it's wrong. And that's just the, you know, when you grow up in a kitchen, that's what you're used to. When you grow up on a football field, that's what you're used to. And I realize that type of leadership does, it just doesn't resonate anymore with our organization. And and I love it. Like, I really do. It's, it's taken me a long time to accept it. But now that I have, I love it. Yeah, really good. Uh, a couple minutes we have left here. I've got two things I want to touch on. Um, talk to us uh, about fellow. I, I think that you'd have to be living under a rock if if you aren't. Those of you that are watching this and listening to this, if you're not familiar with fellow. Um, and if you're not, um, it is, I guess I should be more specific, probably the number one seller lead generation um, uh, tool out there in the industry. Uh, the best in the world teams, and that's not hyperbole or, or using it. Um, talk to us a little bit about how that came to be. Where was the, what was the moment, the discovery, and and what does it do for people? Yeah. 
let's get right down to it. Yeah. So uh, I always like to say when I ask people uh, about how they built their business, I would say 75% of agents out there have a buyer based business, meaning they sell more buyer leads than they do listings, right? Or they sell more buyers than listings. I think that's a, a challenge. The young team's historically been 60% plus listing based business. It's always been something I believed in. I feel like it creates stability, predictability, and growth. Um, the other place that we see is a lot of agents make their investment from lead generation on buyer leads, acquiring new buyer leads. And so we work with all these teams that have spent all this money on acquiring buyer leads, and they have these one, 2% conversions, 3% conversions on those leads. What Fellow has really exposed is all those buyer leads that you acquired over a long period of time are actually a lot of homeowners. And what is the predictability of them actually selling their home? And so what we do is we work with these agents that sync their databases with us and we start marketing to those databases with seller messaging and we create massive seller engagement. And ultimately we're creating a lot of predictability for these agents that have these buyer-based businesses and these heavy buyer databases of we're creating predictability of them into seller leads and then converting those sellers into listings. And so the reason why you're seeing so much traction around it is because when you look at the return on investment of what we can help them create, because they've already acquired these opportunities, they've already spent the bulk of their investment acquiring them, but we're coming in and actually uh, converting them into revenue. They're seeing such massive ROI. It's why it's taking off so fast. And what are, and, and I can tell you, um, you being anyone watching or listening to this right now, firsthand from my clients, he, he's, <laughs> Ryan, <laughs> he, he's got a really good problem and a bad problem. I'm going to tell you why. The good problem is the best in the world are working with him. The bad problem is the best in the world are working for him. And so that's the beauty. And, you know, I'll go back to what Ryan was talking about earlier is to grow he had to get into rooms that were uncomfortable that maybe you know if you're listening to this or or watching this and and gosh i'd like to be there and and uh, but maybe i don't fit or i feel uncomfortable um well it worked for him and now what he's doing is in this startup that is um well it's not a startup it's a takeover now um, I know because I have probably the same anxiety now. Now you understand me, the anxiety of who we have to talk to each day, the expectations, right? Every day. <laughs> what, um, but, it's, but here's what's happening, though, is it's a wonderful business for you. Um, it's because it's, it's really, it's impacting people's businesses that impacts their lives. What are the biggest discoveries that, that you've had in, in getting inside your, we, we chatted about this before we came on. I mean, you're seeing, in my opinion, with the right perspective to drive productivity and get conversion. And maybe I'm, I don't want to speak out of school here, but you're seeing the most critical data. What are the biggest discoveries that you're having that, A, you can share with us that fellow does to help people, but B, even if someone were to to uh, jump on the fellow um, and we'll make sure to give you the, the website so you guys can check it out. But if they weren't to, to, to jump into fellow, what to look for in their database right yeah. now? I think, that, I think you can answer both those with one, yeah. one answer. Yeah, I mean, I think first the, the key to a, a day, a, good databases data, right? And so one of the things that's really important in Fellow is we scan every address in your database every day and let you know if any of those properties list, whether with or without you or off market. And so that's a scramble choking on that when you get that data and you realize how many opportunities we're actually losing, I don't think there's a lot of awareness. We sit with all these leads in the pond or wherever they are and we think the leads suck those leads might've already transacted, right? And we have no visibility and awareness around that. So I think building a database with rich data is really important. It's something we're focused on is basically like strengthening these, these teams' databases that we're working with and really making them seller-focused, homeowner-focused. Uh, the, the other thing that I would just say, what is probably the, the biggest mistake from a marketing perspective, and I'm seeing the best marketers in our industry do this, is making sure that the message is relevant to the right person at the right at the, the right message to the right person at the right time, right? The, the relevancy of your messaging is more crucial than ever. We used to have these like 36 touch that you'd like plug in and it would tell you to like set the clock back, right? It's like, if you're still relying on that to be the, 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 the broker of choice, the agent of choice, 
because you think that's brand equity, it doesn't work. You have to provide value. And that the, we might think we're providing value, but if it's not relevant to the consumer, they're not going to take it seriously or they're going to immediately shut it out. We're so over inundated with marketing and messaging and all these different things that it's like, you really have to get dialed in with what is the right message to the right person at the right time. It's something you're so great at. And, you know, you've always leaned into providing value first. And I love watching and observing now from a marketing perspective of the funnels that are being created and the strategy. And, you know, you, you've always leaned really into providing value and it ends up, obviously you've grown a massive business because of it, but you've always led with value. That is so crucial in marketing these days. And if you're not leading with value and especially relevant value, it is very likely that the audience is going to tune you out. So that's something we're really focused on is making sure right message, right person, right time. Really good. Um, real quick, just so they can uh, let you brag for a minute, throw, throw one out there. What's what's one of the recent um, results that, that someone has shared with you? Um, yeah. I mean, I was just with them. You know them as well. One of the top agents in the country. They probably have the Northeast part of the country, I'm guessing. Northeast part of the country. They've, he's listed, he's been with us six months. He's listed 55 properties. He's a beast. He's a beast. And it's all from reconversion. It's, it's not new opportunities. It's reconverting. And, and the crazy part about it is I have now the data to show him the amount of lost opportunities. And he's like, Dude, the ROI is, th I'm over 30, 40% ROI on fellow. I'm happy. And I'm like, but look at everything that you could, you could be at 100%. Why, why stop at 30, 40%? Um, so cool. You guys are long time friends too, right? I mean, time, yeah. And it's just, I love, to use his so awesome. I, I love to use his example because um, once again, me, I, I don't like to, I hate selling, especially being from, with my peers, you know, and it's what I'm probably most insecure about. And people like that actually had to come to me and say, everyone's talking about it. Should I get on it? And it's like, now that they're seeing the success, they're almost like, why didn't you tell me about this earlier? And so it's just funny that, um, you know, it's just an insecurity that I have. I am very sensitive to being in rooms with my peers and people being scared to have a conversation with me because they think I'm going to try to sell them. And I, it's more, I want to be accepted as an agent because I'm still you know, a team leader, a business owner. And I, the, I'm always just very sensitive to being alienated from that side right. of what I do, you know, and it's, it's my, it's in my own head, but it's like, it's just, it's something that's important to me is to continue to maintain those relationships is not like them being a client, but them being a peer, a friend where we can talk openly and honestly. So something I, I got to work on it. I'll talk to my coach about it. All right. Good. Good. Hey, um, what, to, where can real quickly, where can they find um, fellow where they can research and yes. demo? what's what's um, anyone can uh, reach out to me directly. Oh, just, hi, yeah. Hi fellow.com H I like hi fellow F E L L O. It just ends with an O fellow F E L L O. Or you can just send me an email Ryan at hi fellow.com. Um, and I'd love to just chat. And, and here's the funny thing is real quick before we wrap I got to give a shout out to all my friends in Canada. Uh, there, we are not in Canada for whoever's watching this. And I love so many of uh, John's clients in Canada that I've become friends with. Um, and, you know, it's like one of those things that they're uh, just because fellow is not available in Canada, I can still help you strategize with some ways to provide relevant value to your database, right? And so if you are in Canada and fellow doesn't work, still send me a message. I'm happy to jump on a call and we can strategize on some ways to just get in touch with them and start to create these seller funnels and reconversion and stuff like that. So good. Well, I've got one more question for you. Yeah. Uh, it's an unexpected one. And and maybe it, it comes from because how, how my life has progressed. I didn't expect that I'd be where I'm at right now. And it's in my personal life. And so you see things a little bit different, you know, um, I'm going back, you know, I've got little ones in my home. Tell everyone this, Ryan, because I think it's really, really important um, is that, uh, it, you know, how, how do you beautiful wife, kids and this go, go, go entrepreneurial spirit. And, you know, the last thing you ever do is say, I've got it perfect. You haven't said it's not perfect. We haven't talked real in depth about it, but just from what would you share with people that have that entrepreneurial spirit? You've got little ones and, 
and, and, and families, everything. What are what are you learning as you travel through that? And what's a, what's the best advice that you're learning that you'd give to someone? I'd probably say that I'm probably not the best person to give the best advice. Right. Uh, I love my wife and I have two kids, Winston and Lola. Uh, he's about to be four. She's two. Um, I love him dearly, obviously. Um, I think I have to pick and choose my battles of when I'm with them to be really present because I find myself just because I'm spending time with them. A lot of times I'm not really there, right? I'm spending time with them, but I'm not really spending time with them. And I feel like I'm checking off the box because I'm sitting in the playroom with them on Saturday morning, but really my brain's going to deliverability issues or onboarding or customer success or whatever it is, right? Um, so I, I, what I'm really focused on is being comfortable saying uh, less can still be more as long as when you are with them, you are locked in, you know? And that's something I keep, I have to continually remind myself because sometimes I weave in and out of it, but it's like, less concentrated time is much more important to me. I'm not saying for everyone, but to me, it's more important than more diluted time where I'm just sitting there to check off the box of saying I spend time with them, you know, and, and I'm really fortunate. I've done, a, uh, a, a, I've had a lot of conversations with Pam, my wife about just what running two businesses right now and where we're at and how fast we're growing and about what the expectations are of me and some of the stress and stuff like that. And, you know, we've, we've talked openly about it and she supports me hundred percent. And, you know, I've told her if there's ever a time where it starts to create friction, we have to have that conversation. Um, but you know, I, I would say the more you can stay really dialed in and the times that you are with them is so much more important than just seeing you spend time with them to spend time with them when you're really, you don't want to be there or mentally you're not there. I love that. Um, I'll tell you a funny story and then we'll end on it here. Maybe it's not funny. You probably saw it online, but um, I think the thing that to point out is it's always a work in progress for us. And, and I think the thing we talked about is, is we're all learning as we go in that communication and, and that willingness. Um, I was on the road the last time, Brittany, uh, every night now at 6.30, four cell phones go on the kitchen island at 6.30. And she started a list of chores too. You may have seen that post. So I guess when I get back, there's going to be chores, but yes, I'm, I'm learning too. Listen, I'm learning too. Ryan, man, I love you, brother. I appreciate you. Um, love the work that you're doing and impacting the lives of the people in, in your business, because I'm seeing you. I want to point this out because I get to, to ride pretty close to it and see it. He's doing the most important thing in his organization. I want to reiterate again. He's, he's bringing talent forward. He's not diffusing them out of concern of scarcity. And I think that's the critical piece. I think we try and protect and box people in too much, and that's going to cause high performers to leave, but he's giving them a runway to contribute and have ownership from an input, which is really, really important. And, um, and also the great work you're doing with fellow, be sure and check that out. Ryan, appreciate your brother. Man, I'm so grateful for you. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, man. Thank you.